lightning strikes. In ancient Rome, a lightning strike was an event of utmost significance. A tree, an empty spot of ground, went from anonymity to being divinely touched. At the contact point, a lightning fork or lightning well was erected and the place was declared sacred. Good or evil lay there. In his De Rerum Natura, the first century Roman poet Lucretius regularly employs the figure of lightning in his presentation of the atomist philosophy of Epicurus. In the account of Lucretius, times and spaces are born of a chance bifurcation in the laminar flows of atoms in fall. Like lightning zigzagging randomly through rain, this bifurcation enacts a deviation, what he calls the clinamen, in the fall of atoms. Local stabilities are born. Unlike the thunder auguries, the active deviation, like the strike of lightning, is not embedded in a universal finality or the intentions of the gods, but emerges from a global indeterminacy wrapped in contingency. This model of the world described by, by Lucretius was ridiculed by Enlightenment physicists because it interrupts the universality of laws and opens the closed system of nature. It allows chance occurrences to be inaugural for atomists, space and time are not continuous and sequential, but enacted within indeterminacy. Philosopher Michel Serre observes in Lucretius an early physical understanding of nature. In La naissance de la physique dans le texte de Lucrèce, The Birth of Physics, he finds early conceptions of the, thermo, of the thermodynamic concepts of entropy and negentropy. In the atomist model, the world goes from confusion, tumult and chaos to a vortical movement between what Lucretius calls the turba and the turbo. The declination or clinamen, undetermined, acts in the narrow space between these two states. Entropy, as it is understood in physics, is this general state of chaos and of dissolution, which Lucretius refers to as the turba. Negative entropy or negentropy resists dissolution through an ordering process, which Serre equates with the atomist turbo. And this is what allows him to say, that the Lucretian world is entropic globally and negentropic within the pockets of vertical movement. Lightning strikes and explanations scatter. The Atomist model has gained renewed interest today because as David Webb claims in his introduction to the English translation of the birth of physics, it challenges our understanding of the paradigms that underlie much recent and contemporary science. Quote, unquote. Notably, it bears a resemblance to the world described today by quantum physics. This connection can be drawn through the similarities Sarah observes between thermodynamics and the atomist model and how the notions of entropy and negentropy were, draw were imported into information theory by physicist Léon Brioin in the 1960s. Bri Brioin mathematically formulated quantum physicist Erdwin Irvin Schrodinger's notion of negative entropy in terms of algebraic quantizations, that is, cryptographically. Entropy is thereby not understood as only the universal presence of any order, as in physics, nor as the, only the absence of order, as in biology. To cite uh, Vera Buhlmann's formulation in the Posthuman Glossary, entropy instead is the, quote, maximum amount of a priori cases formulated in a code, any system of finite ordered elements, unquote. Negentropy, rather than being either universal order, or as in physics, or organismic order, as in biology, is any particular manifestation of such a code. Information theory provides a level of abstraction where both the biological and physical definitions of entropy can be rigorously expressed mathematically. In quantum mechanics, the world is founded upon an entropic state in which there is no given order, no overall whole. This state serves as a datum, the objective state of the world within which other things can come into being. As opposed to classical physics, the global space is not metrical. Measurement becomes relative to the local relational context, a sort of quantum physical understanding of subjectivity. The relationships between the elements of these spaces are not absolute among different relational contexts as evidenced by the phenomenon that is commonly known as quantum entanglement or the non-commutativity of observables. There is therefore no absolute path between the local to the global, but rather topo topological regions can be bridged through the introduction of, th of a third system. Um, what I've understand, uh, understood from Elias Zephyrus' work as equivalence classes. 
The birth of new points, a quantum event, is conditioned then both by the constraints of the local context, the datum, and the equivalence classes that glue existing regions together. Although atomist physics is certainly not a quantum theory, as we understand it today, the model suggests that a world founded on chance and inde indeterminacy is not a modern conception. The clinamen can be understood as the mechanical agency of deviation from stability in the fall of atoms. Like a quantum event, it acts on a stable state, the local context or datum, thereby creating a novel instability. As Sarah observes, the stable flees, and science no longer partakes of the general, but of the ultra-rare. The negentropic process enacted by the Klinemann is both subject, subjective and objective. The perceptive subject, uh, to quote Sarah, this perceptive subject is an object of the world plunged into the objective fluencies. Like the problem posed by measurement in quantum mechanics, subject and object are not mutually exclusive. The negentropic turbo leaks, gives off simulacra, sheds information, and by chance or miracle, says Serre, finds a common flow that binds them. Even if the order of the world does not disclose itself in absolute or global terms, order exists locally. There are paths, spaces of communication. When lightning struck, the thunder augurs of ancient Rome were confronted by an event that for them necessarily bore a meaningful relationship to the world. The Libri Fulgurales provided an interpretive key, both in the form of a map of the sky to locate the source of the lightning, as well as instructions to follow depending on where and when it struck. Their apparatus, based upon keeping accurate accounts of past events, enabled the augurs to maintain and follow customary procedures of rationalizing natural phenomena. The radical move of Adamus physics was to give an account of the material world divorced from the whims of the gods and from a single and immediate communicational space. Things are enveloped by an infinite number of veils or simulacra. As Sarah observes in, in Lucretius's account, nature is hidden between, beneath both a cipher and a dexterity. It is encoded and comprised of chance-bound encounters. For Plato, geometry was the mathematics capable of freeing thought from the tyran tyranny of reasoning based upon the procedural method of observation and referral to tables recording a finite list of elements. For Serre, Plato's dialogue Mino defends the supremacy of geometry over this algorithmic reasoning. In a conversation with his student Mino, Socrates calls over a servant boy and draws a square in the sand verifying first that the boy understands that doubling one side of the square doubles its area, and doubling the other side increases it by four. The boy also correctly understands that doubling that square gives an area of eight. When asked, however, what the length of the side would be of, of that square with area eight, the boy is unable to answer, first trying a length of four, which gives an area of 16, and then a length of three, which gives an area of nine. Socrates adjusts his questioning so that the boy reasons not from the sides of the square, but from the diagonal. And the boy correctly understands how to arrive at the square of area eight by multiplying the triangles that form half of each square of area four by four. The servant boy is limited in his reasoning by the adherence to whole numbers and tables of multiplication. Only when he steps into geometry, the triangle with its irrational, uncountable hypotenuse, can he answer Socrates' question. Sarah adds that the servant is stuck in the immediacy of the edges of the square, which he can count and quantify. The diagonal is qualitative. It cannot be counted and must be shown by being drawn. The answer is not in the edges, but in their relationship. Sarah observes that, despite Plato's ridicule, algorithmic reasoning continued to be developed in the Arab world during the Middle Ages before being formalized by Leibniz and Pascal. Their systems of calculation permit ever more sophisticated relationships between memory and abstraction, between tables, hardware, which Serre in French calls le matériel, and procedures, or software, le logiciel, which we observe today in the computer's capacity to perform ever more sophisticated calculations. A nature that is du dually hidden, which is veiled not once but infinitely, questions the possibility of immediately addressing a connection between recorded accounts and the logics by which they can be sorted out. As Serre states in The Birth of Physics, experimentation and in intervention consist in making nature appear. The kind of experimentation of which Serre speaks is perhaps, 
perhaps best demonstrated in the story of the measurement of the Egyptian pyramid of Giza by Thales. The Greek philosopher arrives in Egypt to determine the unknown height of the pyramid. He has a stake, but cannot not use it to directly measure the pyramid, both because it is impossible to do so, but more importantly, because it is a gesture of sacrilege to the greatness of the Pharaoh. Instead, he observes the movement of the shadows, uh, the stake of the shadows, the stake and the pyramid cast by the sun at noon, and is able to set the two sets of triangles into proportion. Talus is able to address the great pyramid immediately, measuring it at a distance without desecrating the tomb. The story of Thales, as well as Socrates and Mino, illustrate for Serre the important difference between artificial memory and intelligence. In his account, both the edge of the square used by the servant boy and the stake used by Thales are nomens. Although usually referring to sundials, Serre understands them as tools to measure against particular sets, whole numbers in the case of the servant boy, whose nomen is the side of the square, and discrete positions of the sun, for Thales, whose nomen is the stake. Each offers a finite set for reasoning. Plato locates these finite sets or tables of elements in anamnesis, in the recollection by the servant boy of a sort of eternal knowledge. But Thales is not using the stake simply to tell time, nor to retrieve eternal, eternal memories embedded as Plato would place it in his soul. Rather, he uses the shadows cast by the sun to construct an abstract space in which two heterogeneous elements, the gnomon and the pyramid, can be treated as similar and be removed from their natural context. He does not possess the table for rationalizing, but lets the sun construct it for him. He constructs an instrument that asks the, asks the sun to speak about the pyramid. Thales can relate to the pyramid and how the sun speaks about it relative to the gnomon. In mathematics, geometric similarity occurs in a space of homothesis. Two figures are homothetic if they share a same point of concurrence called the homothetic center, which permits a translation between them through their similarity in position, uh, through their similarity in position, through homo thesis, homo same and thesis position. Yeah. Sarah reminds us that the story of Thales captures a sense of homothesis that is ancient, that of the tomb, the body, and the stake. These three lie first and foremost in the world as traces. Like the lightning, the augers, and the wells, they are material and are situated, situated in the same space and time. But there is also a second sense of homothesis. The erected body serves as a point of view, an observatory, where time's passing can be told with geometry, can be told and with geometry abstracted from. It situates the statues in a, statues in a single history. When Thales traces the movement of the sun in the sand and arrests time by comparing the triangles formed at a singular instant, he demonstrates a third sense of homothesis, the one of a rigorous science, which can harness abstraction for speculation, planning, and projective reasoning. Thales measures the pyramid indirectly. He uses geometry to analyze a figure, a drawing, in lieu of the thing he is supposed to address. In this sense, observes Serre, Talus goes from a sort of proto-algebra to geometry. He is able to substitute one thing for another, the tomb, the sacred, for a sign. This is the promise of geometry and its ability to bring everything into communication in an abstract space where proto-algebraic substitutions may remain mysterious, yet be referred to rigorously. But this is exceptional. Most attempts to make sense of the real, of the unknown, to articulate a common space of communication when they conflate this abstract space with the real, eliminate or exclude a third. It is a schema common to ordinary practices. The crowd excludes a, mem a member designated to lead or be lynched. Religion excludes the profane from the sacred. Agriculture excludes weeds from the fields. When the view from a single observatory or a single point of view is administrated, administered as the sole representation of the real, the space is no longer homothetic. There is no room for the mysterious or irrational. This is what the servant boy does, and this is what Plato, who ridicules the boy's reasoning, does. But Thales does something different. Two observatories, with their infinity of points of view, permit Thales to found a homothetic space, which is neither his own nor belonging uniquely to the two others. In reading Lucretius, Serre asks in The Birth of Physics how the vortical movements, whose emergence is chance-bound, could maintain their existence against the background fall of atoms. 
He asks this question with regards to the similarity the atomist model of nature has with thermodynamics, in particular with entropy and negentropy, as I mentioned a little bit earlier. In his use of these terms, Sarah is referring not to, the physics, not to physics or biology, but to the information theory of physicist Léon Briouin. Whereas for physics and biology, entropy has to be subtracted from the system either as excess energy or non-metabolized waste, in information theory, the message the neg entropy is only possible because it breaks the continuity of noise that accompanies it. Much like in speech, a stream of, homogene of homogeneous signals or breath is modulated as vowels and interrupted by consonants. The first inaugural act of the clinamen articulates the stream of atoms falling, gradually forming orders that combine, thus founding a homothetic space where their streams can communicate. They occupy not only the same position in space, but also in time, they attain homeoresis. This is not a space of perfect harmony or perfect equilibrium, which would spell thermodyna ther thermodynamic death for such a system, nor are they closed systems. The vortical movements described by Lucretius leak, they emit simulacra signals which only a third can order without violence. Otherwise, one would overtake the other or entirely el eliminate the noise between them, subjecting them to a common logos. Natural processes destabilize and incorporate existing stabilities, giving birth to new integrals of physical space and time. But Thales also founds a new space, using the sun as the third to the stake and the pyramid, perhaps but a rendering of the shadows as a third to the sun and the earth. Rather than subtract, he adds, Rather than exclude, he includes. Thales' strategy is, I argue, architectonic. The three levels of homothesis that Serre discusses in The Origins of Geometry are symmetrical to the three elements of architectonic disposition that pervade Serre's work, the ichnography, sonography, and orthography. The figures of the stake, the pyramid, and the sun are ichnographic in that they lie here and emerge from there. In statues, Serre uses, in his book, Statues, Serre uses the verb jésir, which captures both the meaning of being here, as in the epitaph on a tomb, CG, here lies, as well as something that emerges from the depths of the earth, as a gisement, used in geology to uh, indicate an outcropping. Serre means this both literally and figuratively. Ichnography, from ichnos foot and graphene trace, is presented in his book Genesis as footprints in the sand, which clearly lie here, but are also a gisement in that their emergence, their genesis, remains undisclosed. This, I believe, is the, the, the sense Serre gives to the real as a traced left that lies here or there. Scenography, the common definition of which pertains to theater, is the pers perspectival point, which Serre takes from Leibniz. It is the point of rationalization from which an account is being made or from which something is viewed or witnessed. Orthography can be understood, to borrow from its everyday association with spelling, as that which expresses conventions of a shared or common writ uh, a shared uh, written language. But of course, attending more closely to its etymology, it is that which is regular or proper, ortho, in the traces or inscriptions. Architects familiar with the work of Vitruvius will, of course, recognize the ichnographia, scenographia, and the orthographia from the Roman architects de architectura on architecture, where they are presented as the three elements of architectonic disposition, dispositio. Dispositio, writes Vitruvius in Latin, is an apt adjustment of things, and articulations of the three elements are born of mediation, cogitatio, and invention, inventio. The Latin description Vitruvius gives of cogitatio includes industriae, which is an entomon for modern words like industriousness and industry, and for which Choisy's French translation proposes ingeniosité, or ingeniousness. Inventio, Vitruvius describes with the word explicatio, which is recognizable in words today like explication. The etymological roles of cogitatio and inventio are important in that they capture the actions within which the architectonic disposition is to be articulated. Vitruvius is providing the architectural profession with general principles that are not bound to any local tradition or custom. Disposition can be understood as the entropic state, the plan ability of a combinatorial space. The articulation of the three elements occurs in the planning or design process, which reduces combinatorial possibilities. In Vitruvius's dispositio, we find a thermodynamic system, 
The iconography captures the tendency established by the second law for everything to drive towards dissolution or to noise. The scenography is the mathematical model which provides a zero point, uh, for example, the perspectival vanishing point, and the orthography in respect to the first law conserves invariances. It is in this respect that algebra, or the proto-algebraic geometry of the Greeks, establishes a scientifically rigorous homothetic space through the symbolization of magnitudes, for example, the immensity of the pyramid or the total amount of energy in the universe. The orthography establishes the contract between the rational and the real, where this contract, like the laws of conservation, are natural laws. It is through this parallelism, par parallelism that I think Serre is able to address the Vitruvian dispositio as a natural model. As he states in his book, uh, The Natural Contract, such an architectonic model is natural because it concerns the very birth of things, already in communication, already in a contract. The progress made in mathematics and computation has contributed to the emergence of more sophisticated combinations of both abstract and algorithmic forms of reasoning and their translation into mechanical systems. In his essay, Moteur, Serre describes three generations of motors, the vectorial, the transformational, and the informational. A motor can be defined, according to Serre, by three elements, a reservoir, a differential, and a circulation. The vectorial motor operates according to a difference in space, weight, or number, from a reservoir whose contents, contents circulate in a reversible, reversible manner. This is the model of physics, a locally organized system tapping into a global reservoir. The transformational motor functions through a difference in temperature or state with that which is in its reservoir. What circulates is transformed irreversibly. Here is the model of thermodynamics. Locally organized systems constitute a reservoir and transform its contents irreversibly through a difference in heat or state. The informational motor operates on global and local reservoirs of noise or messages, which generate differences as they circulate and which the motor translates into homothetic spaces of similarity. It is the model of Priyuan's information theory. Data is stocked and converted to information through symbolic ordering processes that in turn always produce additional information and noise, negentropy and entropy. The motors can also be understood in their architectonic disposition. In each case, the motor applies a general model on, or scenography on the mass, the ichnography. The vectorial motor articulates the model in space, for example, in a water mill, converting the movement of a river into mechanical force. Like the steam engine or the nuclear reactor, the transformational motor gathers mass and converts it to energy through heat or chemical reaction. The informational motor stores or taps into flows of mass and codes, symbolizes attributing values like the printing of money or identities like in branding. The first two motors can become organizational logics, that is, scenographies, for the informational motor. For instance, the city has been modeled as a machine, a first motor, or an organism, a second motor. The ability to express the first two motors in terms of the third only highlights the potential weakness of the informational motor when it is thought to provide an immediacy, that is, to establish a one-to-one -one correspondence between the system and the model. This may seem trivial, but in fact, this is what is at stake in the account of Thales and the story of Socrates and the servant boy, the question of the multiplicity of the model or perspectival point in addressing the ethnography. The servant boy, stuck in one scenography, attempts to apply a single motor to the square whose area he must double. Socrates shows him that his adherence to the immediacy of the gnomon, to the edges of the square, do not grant him access to the diagonal, that is a relationship between the edges. Talus discovers that the multiplication of the diagonals in space and in time founds a space in which similarity is possible. Only when the informational motor respects the mediacy of the mass upon which it operates can it be fully architectonic in its disposition, articulating the ethnography, scenography, and the homothetic space of the orthography. The informational motor did not dawn with the modern age and is not divorced from basic human praxis. In Rome, in his books Rome and Statues, the two books of foundations that precede the origins of geometry, 
Serre describes how the techniques that found spaces and times are expressed in social practices. Histories, myths, rituals, traditions and customs all operate to continue to translate multiplicity of space and time into unity, founding a city, a community, or a people. Objects circulate or are emplaced, and like algebraic symbols, they subject all that they integrate to a spatial and temporal order. Serre calls these quasi-objects and white elements as they can accommodate any value. Before the multiplicity establishes white elements, the possibility for symbolization and for the translation of multiplicity into unity are often violent. The possibility for peace, Serre argues, lies in the substitution of that which must be excluded, thereby respecting it. He does not specifically name the informational motor, but he speaks architectonically. The multiplicity of the ethnography is directed towards a single point, a single scenography. In the origins of geometry, it becomes clear that the possibility for peace lies in the orthography, the space of homothesis, which has the ability to mediate between the ethnography and the many points, representations, or scenographies, to establish a new contract between them in a space in which neither is native. In Rome, Serre reads closely the Ab Urbe Condita, Condita Libri of Roman historian Titus Livius as an abstract model of city founding. Livius' book is full of accounts of sacrifice, burial, and murder, evidence of the iterative and substitutionary nature of foundation and of the unification of the multiplicious crowd. How, he asks, can foundation occur without death and violence? One day, recounts Livy, the people of Rome harvested the grain of the Campus Martius, grain that it would have been a sacrilege to consume. They gathered the wheat into baskets, grain and straw together, and dumped them into the river Tiber, where the mud and sand gathered, founding an island upon which temples could be built. Foundation occurred, and as Sarah observes, no one died that day. No one was excluded, even the place of Mars, the god of war. The collective was founded again by a third in the mud and sand. How can the informational motor in its production of spaces of homothesis and homeoresis make peace in the multiplicious noise of the ethnography and the scenography? With quantum mechanics, we are once again facing a world in which nature is characterized by indeterminacy and unable to be broken down into an absolute set of units. Measurement and observation actualize states of the world, that is, the rationalization of the real always contributes to producing the real while being locally embedded in it. The noisy indeterminacy of the real is necessary to make messages possible. A message can only be transmitted in as much as it is foregrounded against a background noise. To exclude this noise means to presume what the message is by default, to erect a temple and to decide what is sacred and profane, to build a model where everything already has its place and where the rest is excluded or expulsed. For such an informational motor to be possible, its reservoir should receive the very noise that is normally excluded. It must, it must import maximum contingency. To follow Serre's basic elements of a motor, what can be said to circulate? They must be frequencies, possible messages that have yet to be interpreted. What differential powers this motor? Can it be anything but this difference between entropy and negentropy, between the noise and the messages, between the frequencies and the noisy background that makes their foregrounding possible? Who operates this motor? Lucretius says it is nature. He also says it is us, and quantum physics tends to agree. We can operate this motor, but we have to work architectonically, that is, to borrow from Vitruvius, with vo both imaginative and meditative industriousness, as well as projective inventiveness. Our reservoirs receive the ethnography, full of possible ob observatories for constituting meaning, but we must actively decide not to pick one, not to privilege a single model. We must create the homothetic space of the any scenography, of the orthography, where various rationalizations of the real can be brought into communication. We are once again augurs, making sense of lightning strikes. But we remember Socrates and the servant boy, and our gnomon is different. We have geometry and can step into spaces of abstraction, taming the irrational through its substitution. But we also have algorithmic reasoning and can proceduralize our processes of rationalization. And our nomens have become powerful. Computation can convert data to information, entropy to negentropy automatically. But a machine, like a computer, is not always an informational motor. It does not, by default, include. 
Algorithms easily impose a single model of rationalization, a single sonography. We have to remember Talus. How can an, ab an abstract machine like the computer found a space in which heterogeneous elements can be brought into communication? With the increase of, a of, a of available traces, for example, large data sets, big data, if you will, the informational motor's reservoir can receive more. With the sophistication of our algorithms, for example, machine learning, the noisiness of this reservoir has become desirable. We are once again augurs, but the heavens are all around us, and we can constitute our horizons. The thunder that resonates casts shadows, leaves traces. We are once again augurs, but for us, everything sparks. Thank you.